All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get rolling here. At least on my clock, we're at three o'clock. So I think we'll go ahead and, and start kicking things off. So for those of you that have just joined us, I was just letting people know that um, I essentially have all the photos of people's IDs that I need for the credits. So if, um, unless you see your name show up in the chat box in a few minutes, uh, you can go ahead and assume that you're going to get the credit so long as you are now here for the full time of the webinar and that you answer the poll questions that will be popping up on your screen about halfway through the presentations and again at the end of this meeting. So for those of you who do not know me, um, I am Mike Bazow, and I am an extension tree fruit specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. I'll be hosting today's meeting along with my colleague Dan Donahue, who is also a specialist on the Eastern New York program, and also Janet Van Zorn, who is a specialist with the Lake Ontario Fruit Program. We're also joined today by our Eastern New York technician, Andy Gallenberti, who's helping us manage the back end of this meeting. Before we get into the meat of the program, I just wanted to review a couple of our Zoom best practices with those of you who might not have been on a webinar in the last month or two as we got into the growing season. So just a quick reminder to you, uh, please keep yourself muted during the presentations until we get to the question and answer and discussion at the end of the meeting. Uh, we do ask that you keep your video off throughout the presentations as well. We're doing that in an effort to conserve our bandwidth just so that the presentations are, are going to be as smooth as they possibly can be. And to make sure you have that, you should have entered the the meeting room muted already, but if you find that you're not, you should have this microphone near the bottom of your screen. You can hover over that and click on that and make sure you're muted. And you should also see this little camera icon to make sure that your video is off. As far as communicating with us through this meeting, uh, the best way to do that is going to be through the chat box. So again, you should be able to hover near the bottom of your screen. You should see this little chat icon and you can click on that and that'll pop up the chat box. So throughout the course of the meeting, as you have questions for our speakers, please go ahead and type them directly into that chat box and we will answer those as we have time. As you can see in our agenda, uh, we do have a, sh a number of short presentations that we're going to be working through and we do have 25 minutes at the end of all the presentations to really dive into your questions and hopefully get some good discussion about what we've been seeing. Uh, so we do recommend that as, as your questions come up, you, you type them in there and we'll be sure by the end of the meeting to get through them all. So with that, again, welcome to our meeting. And I will quickly just show the agenda. We have a number of different topics that we're covering today. Uh, a few months ago, we were approached by a small group asking about some different causes of, of tree decline. And we thought it would be great to, to get a number of, of folks together and just review some of the, the many different potential causes for declining trees in the orchard. Uh, so we're gonna try to cover in sort of lightning talks a number of these different causes today to hopefully shed some light on some of the decline that we're seeing in our orchards throughout New York and the, the Northeast as a, a in general. And so with that, I am going to uh, turn things over to our first speaker of the day. And that is going to be Janet Van Zorn of the Lake Ontario Fruit Program. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. And hopefully you're now seeing my screen. Is that, oops, is that correct? Yep, and it is now on full screen and we hear you just fine. Okay, perfect, sounds good. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and get all the boring insects out of the way first and then we can move on to some more interesting topics a little later on. But really, um, I say boring insects, but I'm basically going to focus on the, I'd like to say the critter causes of tree decline in this particular talk. Um, so I'm gonna try to get through all four of these topics and we'll move through them all pretty quickly to get through it in the 10 minutes. But um, in particular, I'd like to focus on this guy, the black stem borer. This is a beetle that um, it, in particular, a few facts about its biology to help us understand how to, uh, how to deal with it. Um, it's a generalist feeder. So it feeds on a lot of different species of tree, but that said, um, it's a generalist in, in terms of species, but it's very specific in that it particularly focuses on trees that are stressed in some way. 
So it uh, really keys in on ethanol and other tree stress hormones. And it, it kind of aggregates in those trees that have some form of stress going on. It was first introduced to the United States in the early 1900s, but it really wasn't reported as a pest of apples until 2013. And so we're not sure if that's because it wasn't uh, necessarily attacking apples before then, or if it just wasn't causing a great enough cause of concern and it was kind of flying under the radar. But um, since 2013, it's really kind of uh, I would say exploded in a way, and we've seen quite a bit of it, especially in isolated incidences where it's really caused a pretty dramatic orchard decline in some situations. So we've been monitoring the flight of these beetles. Um, and this is these graphs, there's four different graphs for four different growing regions of New York. And uh, basically each of the colored lines is a different location, a different orchard location. And then we're seeing the number of beetles on average caught per trap on the y-axis and uh, throughout the summer on the x-axis. And what I wanna draw your attention to, one thing is that this y-axis really varies by graph um, between one specific orchard in sort of the west of Rochester along the lake here, where at the most we are catching 600 beetles in a trap uh, in one week down to in, uh, in the Champlain Valley up by Mike, where at the most in this particular year, he was catching 12 in a trap. However, that said, the um, sort of overall trend across locations is pretty consistent. Um, a little bit different, something kind of different happened in the Champlain Valley, but overall we're seeing the first spike, the first flight beginning around the beginning of May, the first spike, um, the highest point being maybe mid-May, late May, and then two more sort of mini spikes, mini uh, generations, more or less, um, throughout the summer, and then it really tapering off by the end of August. And so this is when the beetle is flying. And again, um, what does the damage look like? So basically what's happening with this beetle is it's attracted to the tree's stress hormones. So whatever might be happening to stress the tree out, it's emitting these hormones to sort of let everybody else know or just kind of as a byproduct because it's stressed out. And these beetles are keying into that and then they're aggregating and, um, and boring into the trunk of the tree. And then what they do inside of the tree is they're actually not feeding on the tree itself, but they're cultivating a fungus inside of the tree and then they're feeding on that fungus. And they're kind of using the tree as a home to be growing this fungus and uh, cultivating the fungus. And so it's creating these shotgun holes. They tend to be towards the base of the trunk within like maybe the first foot or two of the ground, but they can be all the way up into the canopy. And the holes themselves, just like the beetle, are um, basically think of like the smallest thing that you can see without magnification. And that's how big these beetles and these holes are. So it's really hard to spot on its own. However, once that hole is made, I'll give it a little bit of time and usually the tree will start to kind of ooze sap like you can see in the picture on the left. And then a little bit later, that sap will start to uh, grow a sooty mold and it kind of turns into this dark sooty color or almost it'll look like a fire burnt through the bottom of the tree. And that's a lot easier to spot. Um, but that said, if you see the, the oozing or the sooty, you really still have to get down there on your hands and knees and look at the trunk, maybe with a magnifying glass and look for those holes. Now you can cut into, on the left, you can see we cut into the trunk a little bit, into the bark. And if you peel that back, the hole will be a lot more obvious. So that's a way to look for those shotgun holes to really identify for sure what's going on there. Um, and then the, this feeding, um, even though they're not feeding on the tree itself, it does definitely lead to this rapid tree decline and generally death of the tree. And you can see that in this picture. This particular picture, um, we were at this site a couple, <clears throat> maybe a couple months earlier and the tree looked a little bit sad. It looked like it was kind of struggling, but it was definitely still alive. We came back and as you can see, this was a very dramatic, um, very alarming decrease in tree vigor in a very short period of time. And that's what you'll see with these black stem borers. However, that said, another interesting thing about this picture is you can see the two trees on either side of the, the dying tree look very healthy. And that is again coming back to that um, black stem borer is not the primary cause of decline. Black stem borer is keying into some stress. So for some reason that middle tree was stressed out. The black stem borer came in, um, they aggregated in the tree, but it can turn this sad tree into a dead tree with um, very alarmingly quickly. And so that's where it really becomes problematic. 
So in this particular situation, how to manage black stem borer, this is a case where the, in fact, the best offense is a good defense. So the best strategy is really to avoid these stressed trees. And that can be through strategies like irrigation, through drainage tiles, through avoiding planting in frost, frost pockets, and just general good management practices, trying to keep diseases and insects out of your orchard, trying not to stress the trees with too much herbicide, uh, contacting the trunk, things like that. Of course, these are not always possible, and sometimes you do just for whatever accidental reason or through the weather or something outside of your control, the tree gets stressed. And these are the situations where it um, is really sad to see because you know that that tree maybe gets a little winter injury, it would easily recover, um, or maybe even a whole orchard or a whole block, they would easily recover. But once the black stem borer comes in, it can really obliterate that orchard and, and kind of uh, cause it to decline really quickly. And this is where, of course, we want to be able to control the beetles. Um, unfortunately, the, the sad news is that because um, they're inside of the trunk and because they're not even feeding on the trunk, it's really hard to get an insecticide that will target these specific beetles. Your best option for an insecticide would be a pyrethroid like Danatol or Warrior or something like that which would be timed <clears throat> for the very beginning of their flight. So around that early May time period, um, best case you're out there monitoring in your own orchard using an ethanol bait and a um, soapy water drowning solution. But short of that, you can kind of use um, local trapping information in order to time that pyrethroid uh, insecticide. However, aside from that, there's um, ongoing research that was uh, being done by Art Agnello and some and uh, a lot of our colleagues here, but um, it's sort of on hold at this point. But we're looking for other strategies uh, for a repellent or maybe like a attract and kill strategy. So hopefully we'll um, get some other control strategies soon. Um, there is definitely a lot of research focusing on this moving forwards, but at this point, um, there's really not a lot of good options, unfortunately. So now I know that uh, we're short on time, so I'm just gonna sort of fly through three more different um, <clears throat> reasons for uh, sort of critters causing tree decline. One is a leopard moth. This is another uh, generalist feeder. And a lot of the time, most of you will probably go your whole lives and never experience a leopard moth infestation, um, but you might see it at some point. <clears throat> so this is another pest that it first came in the 1800s. Um, it's been here for quite a while and it will bore, it's a moth, but in this case it'll bore in and it'll kind of basically feed on the branches or the trunk almost like a straw, it just sucks its way right up. So that picture on the upper left corner, you can see that um, there's no size comparison, but it's about an inch and a half or so trunk of a tree. And of course that tree at this point is dead. Um, so it, <clears throat> it will uh, cause wilting, decline, or maybe death of the entire tree. In order to diagnose a leopard moth larva, you can look for frass, um, like in the lower left corner there to, um, to determine if it's leopard moth. And then also, of course, you can just cut open the trunk and uh, see if you can see that hole. And again, insecticides don't help very much. It's best to remove and burn the infected trees. And also, um, an interesting with leopard moth is that the moth itself is very strongly attracted to lights. And so if you have a 24 seven or um, a night light on a barn that's near your orchard, you might wanna just turn that off because that can actually draw in the moth and that can lead to it laying its larvae and, and causing an infestation in the orchard. So that's um, one hint with this particular guy. Um, the clear wing borers, you guys all kind of know about this. This would be things like the dogwood borer. They usually don't lead to this like rapid decline that we're talking about today. So I'm not really gonna focus on this, um, but just mention that mating disruption is a great option for these guys. Um, and then if you're going to use an insecticide, a sale is out there, but it's kind of mediocre. And then finally, just really quickly, I wanna say that I've been to a couple orchards recently um, or in the last year where uh, we saw this sort of rapid decline, what's going on. And then if I get down again on my hands and knees and look at the base of the tree, I can see these two gnaw marks and it was clearly rodents that had girdled the tree. So that's just another thing to be aware of if you see trees that are, um, you don't know why they've suddenly all declined. Uh, look for those gnawing marks. And of course, if you are finding rodent gnaw marks, then um, bait stations or trapping can be a good way to eliminate the rodents and weed control can help to keep the populations down in the first place. Um, so any questions, I know we're going to take questions at the end. I also put my contact information up here so you guys all can um, get in touch with me at any point with any pest management questions, um, tree decline, or anything else. So with that, I think I'm right sliding through in time. So I will stop sharing. And thanks, Mike.
Thank you, Janet. You nailed it right at 315. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll go ahead and hold questions for now just to, to keep us moving along. But again, I, I do encourage everyone to go ahead and, and type your questions into the chat box so we can, can answer them in order. Um, we do have someone asking about spotted lanternfly. So Janet, maybe during the discussion, you can talk a little bit about where we're at with that as well. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and keep our program moving along. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Kara Cox of the Cornell Plant Pathology Department, and he's going to discuss nematodes and apple replant. Mm -hmm. Go button, go. Well, all right, now it's loading. Great, <laughs> I didn't find anything boring about those insects at all. It was quite exciting. I don't know why you didn't lean in that joke, Janet, but anyway, it was practically given to you. All right, nematodes and replant disease. Oh goodness, push that little timer button and then we'll move right along. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the very basics of a nematode of nematode biology because this is something we usually don't discuss in in tree fruit. And then apple replant disease, which is uh, shown in the right over here, is a picture of how they used to uh, manage the problem. I'm pretty sure this is a picture from Washington. All of these came from uh, Bugwood because we just don't have these types of problems in our apples here. And so there are some fantastic image databases that we can rely on. So what is a nematode? Oh my goodness, it's a eukaryotic heterotrophic non-segmented roundworm. Well, what that actually means is it's something that doesn't make its own food when light gets shined on it. It has to eat it. And as you can see in this picture of Pratolinchus penetrans, the uh, nematode of importance in this particular and of apples for the most part will say it doesn't have any segments you chop it in the middle it's not going to grow back it all just gushes out you can see its esophagus its intestines its reproductive parts and unfortunately the stomato stylet if you were here to click on these links you could watch videos of its stomato stylet pumping up and down so what is a stylet um yeah it's basically a hollow spear and what it does is it has these glands inside it that just vomit out literally all kinds of digestive juices that either liquefy cellular contents in the case particularly in pratolinchus penetrans you could see this metacorpus right there and some of the glands just going to pump these enzymes in here and this is just going to go in and out and it's just going to tear up stuff. Now some of these nematodes can do really cool um, changes and turn your plant basically into a genetically modified organism. Don't tell the organic certifiers that's what they do but effectively that's what happens. Now this Pratolinx penetrans is just going to kill your apples um, roots for the most part and they're often called plant parasitic because they sort of straddle the world of insect and diseases. Some of the ones that will transform your plant into a factory of nematode food, uh, we'll call those um, pathogens. But others just sort of ride on by the roots and just snack. They might tear up the roots. And so one of the ones that we're really worried about in regard to tree fruit crops are these ones called migratory endoparasites. Migratory means they're gonna come and go. They're gonna enter into the roots. They're gonna feed on the cells of the cortex and they're gonna get inside. And when the deeper they get, the harder they hit in terms of apples. And then in our case, with some other nice pictures of Pratolinchus penetrans here. This is the one we would find in apples. Um, looks like it's chock full of some eggs right there. Mm. Uh, and it's just gonna get inside the root tissue. You can see some of the bodies of the nematodes inside the tissues and the tail sticking outside. If the root gets too many of them, the nematodes are like, I'm out of here. We're gonna go find another root and tear that up instead. And they are rumored to play a role in the apple replant disease complex. And that is rumored because anytime someone tries to do a controlled scientific experiment on them, they find a lot of inconclusive evidence when the nematodes are removed or put inside. I read a lot of literature about this and it's a very frustrating system to work on. And um, however, there are nematodes that are big like this mesocricanema. And when I was a young child growing up in Georgia, and this is peach tree short life, and these nematodes are entirely responsible for killing peach trees in a couple of weeks. They're big, they're on sandy soils. Nematodes love sandy soils. If you have sandy soils, they might be involved in your tree decline. We'll see, but moving right along. So this is the one that's involved in apples, um, particularly Paratolinchus penetrans. It's another migratory. Its eggs are gonna be in the soil. The roots are going to make some traditional exudates. Um, the nematode eggs will hatch when they detect these up and they'll make these juveniles. 
they weren't really called larvae like in the insect world they're called sort of juveniles and they're just going to go in and out of the roots in mass killing cells intracellularly which means it's just going to go through the cell walls if you were thinking about this as a uh sort of a different scenario it would be as if someone just ran through the walls of your house and out the other side and letting all the air conditioning or heat out depending on where you were and that's what these nematodes do they will just sort of perforate and you can see some really fantastic images that people have collected over the years bugwood you can see the nematodes inside the root function is not going to be good in this particular case with nematodes boring in it and they just really go after those fine roots during invasion for the most part here's some other really fantastic pictures and this is our nematode of interest. Interesting thing about those reading some studies and they have found various soil borne pathogens quote unquote on these nematodes, things like the phytophthoras and the pythiums and other bits of fungal and bacterial organisms get stuck to these, particularly when they're all in the soil together and can be pseudo vectored, we'll call them, just by happenstance of um, um, being in contact. And when it makes a hole, this nematode does, it makes a nice hole for the fungi and other problems to cause trouble. And that leads me to the idea of replant disease. Now, um, all the pictures I'll be showing are pretty much from Washington State, where this is an active and normal problem. I'm even told by one of my friends, you haven't met the replant disease consultant for what? And I, no, I've never read the replant disease rep. Um, just because it's not something we typically talk about here. Um, you can kind of see healthy, you can see trees affected by replant. And what this is, is reduced vigor and productivity in fields re repeatedly planted to fruit tree and we're nut crops of related species like apples going on pears, apples behind apples, right in the row middles. Um, what ends up happening is you get uneven growth, reduction in root biomass, poor yield, um, fruit quality goes down and the trees can actually die. Sounds kind of similar except we have slightly different circumstances here. What causes it? Well, it's been debated over numerous papers, hundreds of papers on this stuff, and everyone finds something different. It can be things like poor soil health, it can be residual herbicide, it can be phytotoxicity from toxins produced in plant roots, it can be various biotic causes such as Pratolinchus penetrans, and more recently there's a lot of discussion about the idea of a disrupted rhizosphere biome, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But moving right along, this is sort of the old concept here. Here's the life cycle of commonly implicated biotic agents. And basically it's various interactions between that lesion nematode, things that you might only get in vegetable crops like Rhizoctonia, Pythium and Phytophthora and something else. And they all constantly go through their life cycle working in a concert, if you will, interactions between nematodes, bacteria, fungi, the Streminopolis pathogens. They're all suspected and very hard to prove that they're all working together because it's a fairly complicated system. Now, more recently, this idea in some of the newer papers is called this dysbiosis of the rhizosphere. And basically what happens is just this collapse or disruption of the rhizosphere biome. And it just leads to poor production and predisposes pathogen attack and collapse of plantings. And so you can imagine in an established apple tree, you've got root shoot communication, you've got microbes interacting with roots, everything's sort of in a nice set of balance. You've got these trophic cascades, you've got this undisturbed food web and you've got efficient resource because it's established. And when you replant in the area, um, all of this just gets disrupted and making opportunities for pathogens, other stuff, stunted growth and sort of a whole um, soil property collapse. And that's what they believe is going on in the most um, uh, recent discussions of the thing. Insufficient resource use, things just aren't well, everything's disrupted. Um, there's stresses, there's those toxins produced from roots and the next thing you know, plants are dying. So what does one do for apple replant disease? Um, Okay, the best thing to do is look for nematode free trees. Every time I get my trees, I'm always looking for nematodes. No, this is hard to see. It's not something you're gonna be able to detect. You're just gonna to have to read about places that talk about doing this. And you can do a five year non-perennial rotation. Yeah, that works out great for every apple grower. Um, it's kind of a hard option and it doesn't work that wonderful. Um, some of the things that Janet talked about are great ideas, minimizing soil saturation minimizing compaction, improving drainage. A lot of what's going on are soil borne pathogens are getting in the mix. And then of course, um, when I first started, they talked about apple replant disease and I planted all my apples in the row middles. I don't think it mattered one way or another because I was doing these things. I was using tolerant rootstocks. And if you had a copy of this, you could click on this cool link 
and it would take you over here to a cool web page where you could see all the, the different Geneva rootstocks and which ones are great. But to summarize it very bl um, bluntly, the G41 and 935, which often have problems in our rad sad area, are very good against replant disease. Um, the Metro Mauling and Mauling series are really bad and susceptible and you know don't really survive this very well. Finally, uh, what else is there as options? Uh, let's click on that. Don't do this. Um, chemical fumigation, it's hazardous. And there are many studies where the more you fumigate, the more unbalanced the rhizosphere gets. And sometimes the nematode populations and the pathogen populations can bloom after you've killed everything else off, making yourself into a sort of a California strawberry production scenario where it becomes more and more difficult every year to do it. So. Um, those are our options for that. Let's look at some takeaways. Pridolinkus penetrans is associated with cases of apple replant decline. It's a possible contributor and vector of soil-borne diseases. Whoa. Destroys feeder roots, needs loose soil. My time is up and we're at the last slide and it's basically either two different things. It's a complex of pathogens and parasites or it's the fact that the whole rhizosphere biome has been disrupted and all kinds of awful things are happening. To beat it, Rootstock, soil health, and planting site management are all uh, the ways to stop this. And I will stop sharing. We'll go to the next talk. All right. Thank you, Carrick. Uh, my apologies, everyone, for I know this is a bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, Carrick, I, I, I do just want to, just because I, I think um, you could answer it in a, a short amount of time. Yep. Um, do standard rootstocks tend to have replant issues? Standard? Uh, you know, I... I wouldn't think so because I think they're they're bigger, I would guess, or they make a bigger tree. I, I it's really only the metro mauling ones. I'm looking. Yeah, it's usually a problem with dwarf. I would have to look up a little more on that if people are actually planting on standards. Yeah, that might be worth looking into. All right, thank you. That Carrick. person we can could, email me. Sure, thank you. And we could always talk more in the discussion. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna roll into our our, our third presenter, uh, Dr. Mark Fuchs, is going to discuss the potential role of viruses in declining trees. Thank you very much, Mike, Janet, and Dan for putting this wonderful webinar together. Thank you, Carrick, for a very entertaining talk and putting me in an odd position. So I'd like to, to have a disclaimer up front. My presentation will be much less entertaining. However, I will take the opportunity to build on one of the ideas that Carrick brought forward, and that is the fact that the roots might be the weak link in the declining of trees. And uh, thanks again for my Janet and Dan for providing the opportunity to explain some of the working hypotheses that we built upon. And thanks to everyone for taking time off your busy schedule and listening to us today. So um, obviously it takes an army to address this type of uh, complex problem. I'd like to thank upfront Anna Wonsch, a grad student in my program, Aves Khan, with whom we collaborate on rapid apple decline, Rosemary, Fuwa, Kyle, technicians in the program. And I'd like to highlight the collaborations with Mario, Janet, Dan, and many cooperating growers with whom uh, it would not be possible to do the work that we are doing. So when my attention was called upon the rapid apple decline many years ago, uh, it was pretty obvious that many varieties, some of just a few at least this year, were subject to the stress trees or decline, whatever you want to refer to it. Uh, but to me, what was interesting from the get-go, it seemed that trees on B9, M9, NIC29, and G935 had a higher propensity to decline than trees on other rootstocks. Again, these were just observations. There is no proven fact that these three rootstocks are more susceptible. So I checked for viruses and opened my toolbox and checked for viruses in commercial orchards or cooperating with nurseries. And I found these five different viruses present in apple orchards in New York, apple chlorotic leaf spot virus, apple stem pitting, apple stem grooving, apple mosaic, tomato ring spot, and apple luteo virus. What was interesting to me is in most of the declining trees that I had tested initially, 
uh, a deep combination of apple chloridic leaf spot and apple stampeding viruses was really predominant. So it's this prevalence of this combination of two viruses uh, associated with a decline. Obviously, uh, this needs to be verified because it doesn't mean that the viruses, if they are associated, they are the causal agents of the decline. Therefore, to address this hypothesis, and you know, here is just an example to show you uh, what was found if the bark was removed on trees co-infected with apple stampeding, apple chloridic leaf spot. You see this grooving, this indentation in, in the wood tissue that obviously affects the vascular tissues and the flow of nutrients and water between rootstock and sign, vice versa. And this is an example of red delicious on G935. So we set up an experimental orchard to address the role of viruses in the rapalapil decline. And we have trees uh, that consist of Gala Honeycrisp, Royal Red Honeycrisp, that are either on M26 or G935. And the different treatments we impose on groups of trees are one virus by itself, a second virus by itself, the combination of the two viruses that we found predominant in declining trees in commercial orchards, and no viruses. And this experimental orchard was planted two years ago, and we are monitoring the virus status of the experimental trees over time. We are uh, assessing tree growth. We are checking the root system and uh, as well as fruit production and quality. So the work started very uh, recently. Stay tuned for more information. In parallel, we are conducting extensive work as well in commercial orchards. And this is a view of actually two blocks. Uh, and we see one row of each block. So the uh, block, the first row here to your left is a honey crisp on NIC 29 in its fourth leaf versus a gala on B9 on its third leaf. And you can see the tremendous difference in vigor between the two groups of trees the oldest trees being those that are really struggling to push. So uh, looking close, a closer look at the trees in this orchard indicating, uh, you know, highlighted basically that uh, the fact that some had declined, those that are flat here with orange flags at the, at the base, while others that are sometimes adjacent are perfect, perfectly healthy looking and vigorous. So what we did is we described uh, five categories of trees. Those with a zero rating uh, were healthy looking. Those with a one were slightly declining. Those with a two were more severely declining. Those with a three were almost dead. And those with a four were entirely dead. And that was our way to quickly assess, visually speaking, the tree growth. And again, you see the decline from zero healthy trees to dead trees, uh, four. And it is the same uh, for blossoms and leaves. And again, you see the, the, the gradients that we saw for uh, both, both organs uh, during the growing season early on. And that's the map of the tree for which we rated the trees from zero to four. And uh, we do that over time. And I'm just going to focus on the June uh, ratings because the take home message here is, and it highlights our personal experience in many other orchards for which trees are declining. There is a random distribution of trees with a three and a four uh, score. There is no aggregation of these uh, declining, the most severely declining trees. And this to me suggests that there is no soil borne agent involved, likely involved in the decline. And there is nothing either that has, or an organism that has any aerial uh, component of uh, uh, associated to its life cycle. Um, so we continue monitoring these uh, trees over time to see uh, how the decline evolves. So in conclusions, 
our hypothesis is that uh, the co-infection by multiple viruses could eventually weaken the roots and therefore affect the vascular system and the translocation of water and nutrients from the rootstock into the sign, vice versa. And experiments either at the Geneva campus of Cornell University or at commercial orchards are underway to test this hypothesis. With no further ado, stay tuned for further information once we are making progress. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, great, thank you, Mark. So, so far we've heard about insects and then nematodes and viruses. Now we're gonna switch over and hear from Dan Donahue, who is a tree fruit specialist in the Hudson Valley. And he's gonna talk about some of his case studies of tree decline that he's been seeing in the Hudson Valley. Hey, Mike, is it up on the screen? Yep, looks good, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, nice to join you this afternoon. I am going to, well, my name is Dan Donahue, work as Mike said with Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture, mostly in the Hudson Valley. We're gonna look at poor apple tree performance, uh, focusing on Eastern New York. Um, this talk is, is gonna be from the perspective of an extension agent out in the field, uh, doing a lot of <clears throat> diagnostic calls on this issue. I do have some research projects out there. We'll touch on those. But I, I sense I want to give the view from 10,000 feet, and at least from my perspective, try to pull together uh, my latest thinking on this topic. And speaking of 10,000 feet, here's a Google map view of an orchard in the Hudson Valley. In the red box, you can see uh, four rows of, of trees. Uh, these, I think, are empires on, on B9 that have very, very poor growth. There's some tree death, but very poor growth. But right next to them are other trees, I believe Zestar and M9, that are wonderful. And look at the pattern across the field. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a pattern to this. So with that in mind, that's poor tree performance. Uh, in this case here, an example of chronic tree decline. Um, and finally, rapid apple decline in an orchard in the Hudson Valley. This tree, when I drove by it four weeks before, looked perfectly healthy. A month later, it's completely dead with fruit on the tree. So in, in my mind, there's really three situations here. There's just um, the high level, poor horticultural performance of certain com combinations in certain orchards. The trees don't necessarily die, but they're just not a good economic unit. The, the growth is not there. They don't fill in their space. Uh, the second case is chronic decline where trees, they die over a period of several years. Uh, and then a situation <clears throat> of rapid apple decline, where again, in my view, it's a tree that looks healthy at the start of the season, leaps out fine, and then for some reason collapses. We did a survey a couple of years ago, growers around New York State, and out of 39 surveys that came back at the time of this compilation, you know, yellowing of leaves was commonly seen, 28 orchards, 27 orchards uh, were seen uh, with uh, sad rad conditions, weak growth in 21, and then other characteristics that growers saw in their declining orchards. And of course, we were curious about herbicides because you, you think about, wow, you know, all the herbicide that hits those trunks, particularly of young trees. Well, the most commonly used herbicide out there was Paraquat or Gramoxone or other formulations. <clears throat> of course, pendimental is a soil applied uh, dinitroaniline. That's not likely to cause a problem. Uh, glyphosate was actually down at only nine reports. So really word had gotten out and by this point, this is about three-year-old data that um, you know, glyphosate may not be so great uh, in a young orchard um, hitting the, those young trunks. So there could be some biotic possibilities here. So when I go out and I make a call, you have to keep an open mind as to what actually might be happening here. And what I found in cases reported to me as tree decline is, you know, oftentimes we can find the problem. Yes, it's tree decline in the sense that trees are dying, but there's a reason for it. And of course the classics are fire blight and the cyan or phytophthora in the rootstocks. You know, and, and the phytophthora could be situations 
of, uh, of wet spots in the field. It could also be cases of overwatering the trees. If, if you're irrigating extensively, but mother nature's providing sufficient water, it is possible to end up with Phytophthora that way. But in several cases, we've seen in the Hudson Valley fire blight in the rootstock from the nursery. And this is really odd, and it doesn't look like a fire blight infestation from the eye. The tree is planted a couple of you know a couple of months later, uh, as it's growing in the summer. Uh, the the whole scion starts to die back, but it doesn't. It's, there's no shepherd crooks involved. The scion uh, looks like it's being uh, girdled or strangled, uh, and it and it dies. But we dig up the tree. Lo and behold, in the roots we find an isolate of fire blight. So the, the, that came in from the nursery. Of course, we've talked about, Jan talked about black stem borer infestation as, a, as another uh, potential cause that we've seen. Cytospora canker. This is not common in apples in the Hudson Valley. However, we had a case of, again, young, in this case, second year trees uh, that were uh, dying and, uh, well, a bunch, bunch of head scratching and, and some testing. And it was determined by a lab out in Washington state, actually, the trees came from the West Coast originally, that it was Cytospora canker that was causing this problem. Uh, Nectria canker. Uh, Nectria causes uh, particularly a branch dieback. So again, walking through an orchard and you see this and you start to wonder about something very uh, nefarious, uh, but in, at least in the Hudson Valley, we do have a fair amount of Nectria out there. Then you get into the really strange stuff. You know, top working virus infected budwood onto virus susceptible G16. So this is something you, you might not think about, but you've got uh, say an orchard, 10 year old Macowan on G16, beautiful orchard, but you don't want the Macowans anymore, but you want to graft over to a cider variety. Cider varieties are known in this case, golden russet known to be you know pretty well full of virus. And we know G16 is incredibly susceptible to virus. So in this case, uh, they were top worked and third year after top working, the G16s started to die. And the, the tree death ended right where the M9 part of the planting started. So M9 is affected by virus, but it's much more tolerant. G16 just dies. Uh, who would have thought uh, about that? Top working using crown gold infected budwood. This is something that popped up this year. This is very, very odd. But uh, where this was uh, G11 on the parent rootstock, uh, trees were seventh leaf when they were top worth. They were Zestars, they were perfectly healthy trees, but Zestar is sort of losing favor as a commercial variety. They were top worked over to another variety. Uh, looked beautiful last year in their first year. This season, many of them started to fade and some are dead. Uh, if you actually look at where the top working graft is, it was an insert graft with a bud stick, you will see galls that look all the world like cron galls. And Carrick did some isolations on those and they're full of bacteria. I'm not sure we did a PCR, but you know, if it walks like, if it walks like a duck, duck and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So in this case, you know, it was crown gall. Where'd that crown gall come from? It's a soil borne pathogen, could have been soil that splashed up. There was no signs of crown gall anywhere on this farm. Uh, could have come in on the budwood. It is possible, but pretty unusual. Um, and final, finally, interactions that we don't uh, don't understand, stuff like Mark is looking at with G935, um, and we're just learning about things. So my, my point here is there can be a lot of explanations for why uh, we see tree death in the orchard. Finally, on the abiotic, of course, we have winter injury. Uh, I've seen it originating in the nursery uh, and then affecting trees on the year of planting when all of a sudden the, the tops aren't growing like they should. You cut them open in the cortex, you see, of course, the discolored tissue. Uh, other situations of winter injury occurring in the orchard. You know, we did have that Valentine's Day massacre of 2016 uh, in February, and that certainly took a toll on some trees, no doubt about it. Um, you know, the combinations where there's a weak soil, weak rootstock, weak scion, and uh, the trees just don't grow well. Uh, irrigation, not every orchard in the valley is irrigated, probably around 50% at this point. And oftentimes the orchards are just fine, 
But if you are on a shaly, droughty soil and you don't have the, the irrigation, then you put the trees into a stress and that's a high risk situation. Uh, aggressive early cropping of a weak scion, again, such as, such as a Honeycrisp on B9, certainly can, can weaken the tree and, and slow down its growth. Uh, replanting sensitive rootstocks into an old orchard ground without implementing a multi-year cover crop program. So again, while certain Geneva rootstocks are very good in replant situations, you know, M9, B9, others are not so good, although B9 is kind of moderate. In any case, and sometimes you don't plan on it, but maybe you've ordered a certain rootstock sign combination for the nursery, uh, they can't quite deliver it here. Will you take these M9s instead? You do, and you end up planting them into a replant situation. We didn't expect it. Finally, herbicide injury, damaged tissue, and equaling the soft rots. It's not, not really fully abiotic, of course, but the herbicide, the chronic herbicide injury, damaging tissue, uh, resulting in an entry opportunity for your bothrosphaeria or your black and your, your white rots coming in. So there's a lot that can go wrong. And here, here's an example, show you a nice picture of a four-year-old gala block on 935. And here, wonderful uh, nectria canker here. Uh, trees are also dying in this orchard from fire blight. And actually, if you start cutting open the trees, you will find at a very young age, they suffered winter injury. In this case, likely from a bad uh, cold weather event out in, out in the West Coast in 2015 where these trees uh, came from. And they're all conspiring to uh, finish off this tree, although the G935 rootstocks look great. Uh, just a review of a case study. I'm not gonna go into detail on this. It's kind of similar to what uh, Mark put up. Um, and many of you have seen me present this. Uh, the difference here is that this block started recording it in 2015, finished up in 2018 in that there was a pattern to the decline. The scale was the same as Mark had used, uh, but there was a pattern to decline. There was a focus, although it kind of jumped around. You can find the details in the Fruit Quarterly that was uh, printed out about, or published about a month ago, if you're uh, interested there. But this was the first case where we found virus, and that was in February of 2017. Um, here is a, uh, a table showing the decline here, uh, a zero tree in the upper left corner. So at the start, when we started doing this in 2015, of the 440 trees, 985 looked perfectly healthy. But four years later, that was down to 483 trees. And you see dead trees increase from 14 in the lower left corner to 184 in the lower, lower right. But again, this was not really random. There was a pattern to this. Uh, this is a map to show where we found luteovirus in, in New York State. And uh, my conclusion on luteovirus is that it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. I don't think you have to look too hard to find it. Although the oldest block we've seen it in is 2008. Regarding luteovirus, uh, in, in this uh, study that I, I'm just showing the data from here, well, we took some, some data on luteovirus infected trees versus clean trees. And what we did find is trunk cross-sectional area was significantly less in luteovirus trees. Uh, I wanna point out that there was very little latent virus in this block. It was predominantly clean. Uh, a few trees had apocarotic leaf spot, but what we found was luteovirus. Uh, and another way to look at it, terminal growth extension. This is one year worth of data where again, trees with apoluteovirus had significantly less. Uh, terminal growth, and we saw this again in the next year as well. Okay, this is, is what we call the 100 tree grid study. This is still ongoing. I'll talk about the results uh, next year, but I wanna point out here is that of these 100 ran essentially random trees we looked at in the Zestar orchard, only eight were entirely clean. The other 92 had different combinations of latent viruses, tomato ring spot, uh, and or Apoludia virus. 41 of these 100 trees had the Ludia virus. So basically different growth characteristics are being recorded. The trees are going to be sacrificed here this fall. Uh, we provide, we, uh, we gave these a stress about a year, about two years ago. Wanted to see how these trees respond. So there'll be more to talk about later. So, so really what, you know, am I concerned about here? There, there's, we live in a much more complicated 
Apple business these days. You know, we're dealing with new and unproven varieties that are constantly being introduced. New and essentially unproven rootstocks are being introduced. Limited field experience with the combinations of the above. Uh, we don't always know how the two are gonna work together and under what conditions they're gonna do well and not. So we're learning about that. New planting systems, I don't really feel it's an issue, but it's just another variable in there. Uh, I, there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, you plant trees three foot by 11 and, and that's awful close. It puts a stress on the tree. And uh, I don't know, I, I've been dealing with these since the 19, uh, 1980s. I, I really don't think that's an issue. Uh, increased economic pressure to replace semi-dwarf systems quickly. So we have pressure to replace our orchards. We need trees, need a lot of trees, not 200 per acre, we need 1200 per acre. And of course, increased marketing pressure to change that variety mix really quickly. I call this the iPhone system syndrome. You know, we want a new iPhone every two years. Well, let's, let's have new Apple varieties every couple of years, but we know that's not possible in our line of work. Um, although the general public and marketers don't always grasp that concept. Uh, we're in such a hurry, there's no time to properly rejuvenate old orchard ground. We tip over the trees in October after harvest and we have a new orchard established in April. And I think there's been an awful lot of pressure on the nursery in industry you know, in the last 15 years to ramp up production while maintaining quality. And I think in some cases that the quality has suffered and on the grower side, I think in some cases, growers have, have slipped in what they're willing to accept. Again, going back to the earlier points of having to switch the varieties over, having to switch their planting systems over. Uh, so finally, you wanna maximize both orchard potential and tree quality. And so insist on top quality trees, know where your grafting wood comes from. You want virus free, only half inch and larger. There's nothing new here. We've been talking about this for 30 years. All right, again, carefully choose your, your combinations uh, based on your site and your experience. Irrigation is a good thing to have, at least from a risk management standpoint. Um, map everything. If you call me in five years from now and say, my trees are dying, first thing I'm gonna ask is, well, variety of course, but then what's the rootstock and who's the nursery? And if you can't tell me that, I'm sort of dead in the water with how I can help you. All right, Cons consider a rotation, pre-plant rotation, and call us in if you need some additional help. Um, sorry, Mike, as usual, I went over for a few, by a few minutes, but uh, I wanna thank, you know, everybody has contributed this, including Mark, Peter, Surgeon, Katarina, Rui, Carrick Cox, uh, Dave Rosenberger, and of course, my, uh, my technician, Sarah Alani, and then of course, Sarah Tobin. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dan. You didn't go over too bad this time, so you're, you're in good shape. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you, Dan. Before we introduce our next speaker, we're gonna go ahead and launch our first poll question. And again, that is for those of you seeking recertification credits. We're gonna go ahead and launch that. And all you have to do is it should pop up onto your screen and you'll just need to answer. And if for some reason you're unable to answer it in the pop-up window, you can always just type it into the chat box and we'll record that you answered it that way. So let's see if I can go ahead and launch this first question. So you should see a window on your screen asking about black stem beetle. I'll just go ahead and give a few minutes for people to respond to that. All right, I'll just go ahead and give it 10 more seconds for, so people can get it in. All right. So the answer here, and it looks like everybody just about got it. 
uh, false. Generally, the blackstone beetle is going to be attacking trees that are already stressed. All right, thank you. And here you should be able to see the full results there. And then we'll have one more of these poll questions at the end of this meeting, uh, just so you can get those DEC credits okay. So now we'll, we'll transition into our next speaker. We're gonna go outside of New York for a little bit, and we're gonna hear from Dr. Carrie Peter of Penn State University, who's based down in Biglerville. Can, do you see my uh, presentation? I do, Carrie. Yep, it's currently it, in um, presenter it, view. Is it in the wrong mode? Yep. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm on my oh. desktop with two screens, so you know I always get discombobulated. So do you <laughs> see the correct screen now? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, good, great, thank you. So I, I appreciate uh, Mike and Dan inviting me to come talk about the Pennsylvania perspective as far as what's going on. Uh, a lot of a lot of similar issues, but some new issues too that may or may that you may not see because we're a little further south and a little warmer. So I'm going to be covering four things rather quickly. Uh, the first is the RAD syndrome, and I'll address why I'm calling it syndrome, the RAD syndrome as opposed to just RAD. Um, tomato ring spot virus and tobacco ring spot virus, crown gall, and southern blight is the new disease affecting us. So first, as far as the, the rapid apple decline syndrome, so I'm, I'm calling this a syndrome because I don't believe it's a single um, biotic factor, uh, like as far as a pathogen goes, I think it's a complex of issues that's causing the problem. It's only in high density plantings. And it's in what I'm calling RAD is limited to M9 rootstocks. As far as what's happening with the Geneva rootstocks, like 935 and 41, I think that's a separate issue outside of RAD. Um, something's happened with M9 in the last 10 to 12 years. M9 has been grown forever, but something changed in production practices uh, in the last like 10, 12 years ago that has shifted it where it, now M9 has sort of become the rootstock non grata. Um, the nurseries don't want to touch it anymore, especially there's some big nurseries that are not growing any M9 anymore. And there's some, there's at least one nursery that is not growing M9 NIC29 anymore. So something's changed, not quite sure what it is, but as far as the cause of this issue, it's most likely multiple factors. And where the battleground is, is at the graft union tissues. The roots are always healthy, but something's happening that's stressing out that graft union. And so as far as other diagnostic characteristics, well, one, how I know the roots are healthy is we've dug up a lot of them, but there's always rootstock suckers um, that are growing in these trees. Um, the collapse occurs very quickly. And we know that tree stressors are important um, because, but we don't know what that, what the, tr what the initial stressor was to sort of be the first domino that makes the tree susceptible to organisms that cause white rot, phomopsis, a black stem borer. And so in Pennsylvania, we're involved investigating multiple culprits like herbicides. We have an herb, a small herbicide experience going on, experiment going on. Viruses are definitely on the table, looking at ambrosia beetles, temperature fluctuations as far as analyzing sort of what's been going on the last 10 or more years, um, drought or too much rain, combination of issues or microorganisms. This is sort of a real um, you know, this is a real puzzle with this, this RAD issue. So we've got a lot of irons in the fire with investigating it. Um, the next issue is something I think is occurring in, in tandem with RAD, but not a part of RAD. And that is we're finding issues of trees being infected with tomato ring spot and or tobacco ring spot virus. And this first came to my attention primarily last year in a block here at Freck in the horticultural side of the farm, where there was a 2015 planting of uh, Ultima Gala on G11. And in this picture, you can see there are these two smaller trees that are surrounded by big trees. These trees were all planted at the same time. Initially, I thought, well, this is rad. It was showing sort of that rootstock, I'm sorry, the graft union issue going on. But it just doesn't didn't seem quite like rad because the trees had been in the ground a long time. And this was sort of a slow burn when it came to the decline where the trees were all planted at the same time. But these two trees, actually, there was about 10 in this in this row that just never got the height or like the diameter of the trunk um, compared to the healthy looking trees. 
And uh, I've also seen this phenomena in other orchards that have planted Geneva 11, a mix of Geneva 11 and G935. And what the common, common denominator with these trees is that they were infected with um, tobacco ring spot virus and or tomato ring spot virus, either one or both of them. So why are these viruses so important? Well, they're transmitted by dagger nematodes. In Pennsylvania, it is no secret, we've got an issue with dagger nematodes. So when we talk about replant issues in Pennsylvania, they pretty much all lead to the dagger nematodes because dagger nematodes are virus vectors. And so when I saw that we had tomato ring spot virus infected trees, we did some surveying in our farm and we found loads of dagger nematodes in 100 cc of soil. And so this is just a snapshot of various locations on our farm, but to suffice, to, suffice it to say, um, one dagger nematode is the threshold for control, and you can see we've got boatloads, like we aren't at a loss form. So we've got major issues with dagger nematodes, definitely here at Freck, but I know we've got issues across the state. Um, so this dagger nematodes are, are, are really the, the nematode that we worry most about in Pennsylvania, especially when related to replant. So as far as what are growers supposed to do as far as prepping their soil, we really encourage them to do this um, bio-renovation or biofumigation using the sorghum Sudan grass followed by rapeseed. So they grow both of these crops, cover crops up, and then they chop them and incorporate them. So they're gassing out the soil naturally as opposed to using chemical fumigation. So uh, we this has been around for a while, this, this method, but growers aren't using it. So now the issue is trying to figure out how to get growers to adopt this practice more often so they don't encounter these issues, um, which really are this, they can manage this, they can manage dagger nematodes. But again, for, every, for all of the reasons that people have said before me as far as why people don't prep their soils appropriately, well, you just add them to the list here as far as why. Um, so we, Penn State, we have a website with a, sort of this step-by-step -step, um, um, method if people are interested in looking at it. So going on to the next issue is crown gall and apple. So this came to my attention a few years ago where I had a very observant grower in Adams County who bought trees and planted them in 2015. And in 2016, the trees just didn't look quite right. I mean, you could wiggle the tree back and forth when we dug them up, they didn't have a good root system. And when we dug them up further and washed the soil off, turns out the rootstock was loaded with crown gall. And so then the question boiled down to, is the crown gall coming from the grower's orchard or did the trees come with crown gall? So I made a call to the nursery and they reluctantly gave me the names of two more growers. And I investigated um, those growers because there were 15,000 trees from said nursery that came to Pennsylvania. So they were split among three orchards and I investigated all three orchards to, to determine how best to advise this grower in Adams County. And so when I visited these orchards, they had these trees in the ground and some looked weaker than others as far as smaller. So when we dug them up, and again, these trees also had crown gall as well. However, what I did find interesting is that the grower who did have crown gall and whose trees looked fairly well, he recognized in year one that he planted that his trees looked a little weak. So he really pushed his trees. And so that's where you, why you see this massive root system. And I believe that's why his trees were doing as well as they were doing despite the crown gall. Crown gall won't kill the trees, but they'll definitely cause a tree to grow poorly. And so he compensated for that compromise in the root stock and, and so his trees rebounded. And so when, and these are just other, other examples of crown gall on the root stock. And so the question then becomes, these trees became, inf they came infected. And so this, as far as nursery infected trees with, um, with crown gall, this is a not so secret secret, and I won't name who the nursery was, but it wasn't an East Coast nursery to, to narrow things down. And so this has become really frustrating because seeing a lot of trees go in the ground or a lot of trees that I dig up that have crown gall on them. So growers need to take it upon themselves to really inspect their trees very closely before they put them into the ground. You know, pay attention to suspect growths. 
And there are products that you can use to sort of limit crown gall infection, one of them being gall troll, which you can um, dip your roots into, and this will sort of prevent proliferation of crown gall. Crown gall survives through open wounds. So if you have an open wound, this is where the mess occurs with crown gall. And then as far as minimizing tree stress, adequate nutrients, adequate ir irrigation. And as I mentioned with um, the grower, the, the next door neighbor of the grower who also had problematic trees, his trees looked weak. I recommended that he push his trees with some fertilization. And when he did, and I visited the next year, his trees looked phenomenal. So that extra fertilization did produce that root mass to seem to overcome that compromise that the crown gall was um, was doing with, with limiting the growth of the tree. The last disease I'm gonna talk about is Southern blight really fast. So Southern blight in Pennsylvania is being caused by scler um, Sclerotium delphinii. This is very similar to Sclerotium rolfsii. For some folks out there who have uh, diversified farms, this because this can affect carrots and soybeans and tomatoes. This can survive a long time in the soil and this really creeped up fast in South Central Pennsylvania three summers ago in 2018 when we received 80 inches of rain that season and that is in contrast to our normal 40 inches of rain. That was also a real hot summer and we saw newly planted trees or very young trees collapsing and but this this can also affect older trees like 10 year old trees. This issue unfortunately has not disappeared despite our lack of rain the last couple of seasons trees are still dying. And unfortunately, there are no effective post planting management strategies. So this has become a real big thorn in my side with regards to how to advise growers. Um, but it seems to be sort of limited to the southern part of the state where it's a little bit warmer. And as far as what we see as diagnostic signs of the disease uh, to the above ground, this is what you see above ground. So you're thinking, oh, no, this could be rad, but it's not rad. It's actually a southern blight. You see sort of this webbing, this mycelia or white webbing at the crown right at the soil line, and then these tiny little seeds, which are actually the sclerotia. If you dig up the soil, you will see the white mycelium through the soil. The white mycelia on the crown is most evident under high moisture conditions. So if you have tree guards and you see a tree declining, chances are if you pull up that tree guard, you could possibly see this. Um, but I don't think this has crept as far north as New York but this is what I pretty much do when I see a tree declining as I lift up that, that tree guard. Um, but it kills the rootstock, essentially kills the tree. It's like once you see symptoms, it's too late. And so again, I just um, there's a lot of people to thank that I didn't get a chance to put an acknowledgement slide, but the folks at the Pennsylvania Department of Ag and my crew here um, at Penn State are very critical in sort of helping helping me uh, sort of manage all these issues that are occurring. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you so much, Carrie. Mm -hmm. I, was, um, I was down in Pennsylvania while we were doing that grower demo of the, the bio covers between plantings. And I mean, you really did see the difference in the, the nematode levels before and after. It certainly is a process to, you know, to get them planted and to chop them and get them covered. Uh, but if, if people do have questions on it, please feel free to reach out to Carrie or me, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you a little bit more about what that process looks like. And thanks again, Carrie. Thank you. So again, if, if people have questions, I, I just remind you to go ahead and type them into the chat box. And once we get to the, the Q&A section, we'll go ahead and address all of them. I do want to thank Wynn in the chat box too, he, he did mention that gall troll that Carrie talked about is not labeled in New York. So it, it needs to get a New York label. Uh, so just be mindful of that if you were thinking of, of looking into that product. So with that, I would like to introduce our last speaker of this afternoon. We're gonna hear from Dr. Terrence Robinson, who's gonna talk about some of the various other abiotic factors that can be causing tree decline in our orchards. So I think there's two major reasons that trees die that are not pathogenic. Well, I included herbicide as a third because it wasn't really covered uh, in all the disease and insect issues. But winter damage is the primary one and it comes from three different types of damages. We can have a late fall, early winter freeze and I cite the Thanksgiving Day Massacre of 2018 in Western New York. I'll show that date in a minute. 
It can also happen for midwinter warm ups and then rapid drops in temperature where the drop is about 40 degrees over several three or four or five days. And I cite two experiences, the New Year's massacre of 2004 and five and the Valentine's Day massacre of 2016. It can also happen from late winter rapid cold snaps after the trees start to grow and we get a rapid drop in temperature. Now drought uh, can uh, cause tremendous damage to trees, but it's usually not the primary cause of death. However, it can weaken trees and make them more susceptible to winter damage or other problems. A serious problem has been in the past herbicide damage. It's usually not the primary cause of death. However, it can weaken trees, especially when either glufosinate or Roundup hit the trunk. Those two particular herbicides have been very problematic, especially on varieties like Zestar, but also on many other varieties. Because the primary cause of death often is winter damage, I'm gonna focus on that. <clears throat> this is the first example I wanna give. This happened in 2018 in Western New York. It was a Thanksgiving day drop in temperature. And I show the temperatures from the 11th or from November the 6th up through November the 19th. And you can see temperatures were in the 60s for the maximum. We dropped down to slightly below freezing but it never really got that cold. But then right before Thanksgiving, temperatures dropped dramatically while the trees still weren't hardened off. And we got down into the almost uh, zero, three degrees. That then exhibited the next spring damaged trees, particularly young trees that had just finished their second or third year after a first crop. Now, trees are more sensitive to these kind of winter damages at a young age. First, because that first and second crop uses a lot of carbohydrate resources to produce the apples and very little is put back into the tree, but also because the root system is smaller. <clears throat> uh, a second type of um, damage is this midwinter warm up period. And this was a dramatic example in 2004 and five in the Champlain Valley, right near New Year's, temperatures warmed up. They had decent snow cover in uh, December, but all the snow melted. And you can see the daytime temperatures, 40s, 30s or the Champlain. And then right here about the 14th, we got almost up to 50 degrees, there was no snow. And within three days, we were below zero with temperatures down into minus 16 and minus 17. That resulted in tremendous damage. We were lucky enough, <clears throat> although the grower, which was Shazy Orchard, wasn't that lucky, but we had a large rootstock experiment up there in which we were able to evaluate winter damage on a, about 15 different rootstocks. And this is the data from that. We had both Honeycrisp and Macintosh. The scions were not damaged. Both Honeycrisp and Macintosh are very winter hardy. But if we start on the right-hand side and look at MM106, 100% of the trees were dead on Honeycrisp, um, only 17 were alive on Macintosh. And you can see they go in order of more and more survival. Surprising to me, B9, which is quite hardy, suffered tremendously with Macintosh, only 37% alive. And these were 50 trees of a, in, a, in the whole block of each rootstock, it's a fairly large trial. Even with Honeycrisp, only 66 were alive. M9, Similar to B9 in this particular case with a warm up in early January, January, followed by very cold temperatures. Bud 118 did a little better, but the best that had 90% survival were two Geneva stocks in there, two Vineland stocks, and Ottawa 3. Now, Ottawa 3 is known to be very winter hardy and very tolerant of these winter warm ups. Ottawa 3 is one of the parents of almost all the Geneva rootstocks, which is one of the reasons they tend to survive these midwinter warm-ups. <clears throat> a third and fourth example was 2016 while I was away on leave. I show temperature data for the Hudson Valley and also Biglerville PA because I think that a tremendous amount of this uh, tree death that was seen through that when people started to get worried about RAD was caused by this event in 2016, which Dan's already mentioned is the Valentine's Day massacre. 
In Hudson Valley, we had temperatures in Jan late January, the 26th, got up above freezing, and at the end of the January, got up to almost 60 degrees, 50s, 50s. And then very shortly after that, we uh, dropped. Uh, how did I go back? dramatically over several days to where we got uh, minus 10 within about seven days of these 40s and 50s. That was a 56 degree drop over a one week period of time. And that I think set a lot of trees up with some damage. Surprising to me, it even happened further south in Biglerville. Temperatures through that same early February period got up into the almost 50 and they got down not to below zero, but down to seven. <clears throat> With this kind of temperature drop, we see damage that is primarily on the rootstock part of the tree that's exposed above ground. Now, what happens is the trees leaf out normally in the spring after winter damage, but about full bloom, they begin to collapse. Some trees don't collapse then. They hang on until midsummer and then collapse due to water stress when it's hot. Some trees are weakened by these events, but survive the whole year and then collapse the second year. And some trees survive two years and then collapse. What's happened is that the rootstock shank has been damaged and the cambium and transport tissue sometimes is completely girdled. Those trees collapse at bloom. There's enough reserves to get the tree from green tip to bloom and then they collapse. But in other cases, there's still a little bit of cambium left and that tree can survive till midsummer when the heat causes a tremendous uh, need for water and the tree can't keep up and it dies because of lack of water transport. And then others are just weakened to suffer again the next year and eventually die two or three years later. <clears throat> I'm showing a picture there that's not really uh, appropriate because I didn't have the right picture. That's a fire blight ooze picture, but I'm showing it just to show that the damage from winter usually occurs to the rootstock shank that's above ground and a few inches below ground. Damage occurs only when there's no snow. So in areas where we have deep snow cover, we don't usually see rootstock damage, but when there's a warm up period and all the snow melts and then a rapid drop in temperature without snow, that area from the graft union down to the soil gets girdled and all the cambium is killed. So what I try to do in diagnosing this, I dig the tree up and I cut into the cambium longitudinally down from above the graft union a foot, down through the graft union, and then down along the exposed shank down to roots. And what I generally see is that the roots below are alive. The, the cold penetrates usually only three or four inches down into the soil, killing the rootstock shank. So below that, Six inches below that, the trees, the roots are alive and often can throw up root suckers. But the damage to the cambium tissue of the rootstock shank itself girdles the tree and then it dies. <clears throat> if the damage, if the cyan variety is also a sensitive one, you then see damage above the graft union. Now, for varieties like Honeycrisp and Macintosh, often there'll only be just a slight bit of damage above the graft union, but you don't see much. It's generally at the graft union and below because rootstocks tend to not be quite as hardy as the cyan. Now, unfortunately, distinguishing winter damage from rootstock fire blight can be difficult because fire blight also kills the cambium of the susceptible rootstock, especially M9 and M26. So what happens in this little diagram I'm showing on the right, fire blight affects a shoot and it travels symptomless down through the branch and the trunk. And when it hits the graft union of M9, it girdles it. Now the tree can survive for several months and often you see in the fall, these uh, have uh, different colored foliage, foliage because they're girdled and then they die the next spring. And so sometimes you can confuse that with winter damage. But usually when there's fire blight damage, there's generally blackening down on the shank. But even myself, I sometimes can't distinguish them. But it's important to note that, root, that fire blight killing the rootstock is one of the major reasons of tree death in the Eastern US, especially when M9 was one of the most popular stocks. 
With the Geneva stocks that are more tolerant to fire blight, we don't get that. And so the tree doesn't generally collapse like it does on M9. Now, distinguishing winter damage from Phytophthora, I think, is quite simple. Phytophthora infects secondary and fine roots below the soil and also then can get into the below ground shank and leaves a reddish color when the cambium is scraped away from the roots and it has a pungent odor. But generally, it's down into the soil. It's not right at the soil line and not generally above the soil line on the rootstock shank. Whereas winter damage is usually very visible on the rootstock shank that's above the ground and slightly below the ground. <clears throat> so my opinion that the reason that trees die, or the top five are these. Now there are many secondary reasons, but I think that the mass majority of trees that die that we see are from fire blight infections on M9 and M26. They're very susceptible, while the Geneva stocks are resistant and B9 is quite tolerant. The second most important reason trees die is winter damage after a rapid drop in temperature in late fall or midwinter or early spring. Now the Geneva stocks that originate from Ottawa 3 are, tend to be very hardy. And so much of the rad discussion is focused on M9 type trees because I believe that much of that is a winter damage issue. Now Phytophthora is also a problem, not so much with M9, but with M26. And it follows infections that happen in the wet spring or a wet fall and the trees die the next year. Ambrosia beetle, I think, is also a critical cause of tree death and then herbicide damage. Now, with the lessening use of Roundup and fewer people using glufosinate or rely, I haven't seen as much of this. But all of the other reasons given today, I think, are much secondary to these primary five reasons why trees die. And that's my opinion. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Terrence. Certainly there is a, a lot of different causes for, for the, the damage that we're seeing. And I I just like to thank everyone for giving us their uh, their expertise and, and talking about all of these various factors. And certainly there there is uh, no factor that really exists in a vacuum. And, and certainly we can see all of these, these various things within any given orchard. Um, so with that, I, I know it, it is certainly very complicated, um, and, and certainly I would like to open it up so that we can discuss questions that people have for what they've been seeing on their own orchards. Before we do get into questions, again, uh, please go ahead and, and type away into the chat box. Um, but before we do, I'm going to go ahead and launch our final poll, just so we can get that out of the way for those of you that are here, um, at least partially to, to get DEC credits today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that and we'll be able to answer that. All right, so you should now have the, the last question up on your screen. And again, go ahead and you can click whether uh, that's true or false, and then we'll have that for your credits. And we had about 60 or so people respond last time. So I'll, I'll wait till we're about it there again and I'll give about a minute. And again, if you're having trouble getting the poll box to work, you can always type your answer into the chat box and I'll make a record of it that way. So I'll just go ahead and give it another 10 seconds or so. All right. So for this question, the presence of healthy root suckers on a declining tree is a common symptom of rapid apple decline in Pennsylvania orchards. And this one was true. All right, thank you for bearing with us through that. 
Uh, so now we'll go ahead and launch into our questions and I'll go ahead and start in the chat box. And again, feel free to go ahead and type yours in. So we'll go back. I know we're, we're kind of going a, a ways back now, but there were a few questions on, on some insects. Uh, Janet, any thoughts on spotted lanternfly and how that might be playing into tree decline at all? And then yeah, also, definitely. or go ahead on, on spotted lanternfly. Sure, I'll start with that one. Um, yeah, so I would say in New York orchards at this point, there's really no reason to suspect spotted lanternfly is, is causing any significant decline um, because it just simply isn't really here yet, at least um, in, in our region and not in numbers that are high enough. Uh, the other thing was by the lanternfly, I'm not going to say that it won't go to apples, but it's not a preferred host of spotted lanternfly. So as the populations increase, it seems like it is sort of ending up in apples and possibly causing some problems, especially around near harvest time, if it might be um, getting uh, sort of causing problems with the fruit, but it isn't um, it isn't likely to get to that level in New York anytime soon. So that's the good news on spotted lanternfly. In terms of orchard production, if you have grapes, that's another matter. Um, it's much more likely to cause problems with those. But um, apples at this point, you can breathe easy. And then um, there was one other question on insects. I remember, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. So oh. the next one, Janet, is there an established range or significant area of infection in the Northeast orchards for uh -huh. leopard moth? Yes, so um, in terms of that question, the leopard moth really in the in the northeast, it's pretty much across our region and it's, I don't know that it has, there's not a lot of research on it because it is so sporadic, but I don't know that there's any reason to suspect that it's better or worse in any part of our region. If you go pretty far south, like down into Georgia, Florida, I don't believe it's down there and I don't think it's really out west yet. Okay, thanks Janet. So now we're we're into our, our replant discussion with Carrick. Uh, Carrick, there was a, a, another question for you. Do you see the same replant issues in organic orchards relative to conventionally managed orchards? Uh, I think it, it ne wouldn't necessarily uh, matter conventional or organic. A lot of the factors for control are rootstock and the M series seems to just be not great these days for everyone. I think it wouldn't necessarily uh, matter the, the conventional fungicides aren't going to stop toxins from being released by roots or and right now a lot of the work on microbiomes doesn't suggest that you know a conventionally managed orchard disrupts the microbiome or the rhizosphere by any stretch of the imagination uh, fumigation would but um, I, I think you would just have encounter the same thing and I don't think organic production is a way to avoid the replant problem at least um, I know Washington State still struggles with it, and there are active consultants on it, and they have a lot of organic, so um, they don't think you'll escape it that way. All right, thank you, Kirk. And we did have something from, from Ian in the chat, too. He, he just wanted to mention in his research, uh, Geneva 210 was also resistant to apple replant. Thanks, Ian. Another question here, this one on, on nematodes. So Carrie and Carrie, feel free to, to both chime in. Um, if it's a new planting that never had apples, are nematodes going to be a problem? And I, I think, ahead, Carrie. Carrie, you might've addressed this in the chat, but I think it, it bears repeating for the people that are gonna be listening to the recording of this. If you are anticipating planting an orchard, you need to check the soil for nematodes. You also, you also need to do a soil test to see where you are with your nutrients. I mean, that should just be standard practice um, to know your baseline, to know if, if you need to do anything, because the best time to manage nematodes is before any trees go into the ground. That's the easiest time to manage, because once trees are in the ground, it's really difficult to manage nematodes appropriately. Um, there, are, there are some products out there that, that you can apply to trees like through your irrigation line or through drenching, but it's not nearly as effective as if you do something pre-plant. I don't know if Carrick has any, anything else to add. No, I, I would just agree. It's, it's if you can, and there's a, a way to look at it um, and indeed do it. I mean, Mark and I have found Ziffin even the southern portions of the state doesn't mean that can't be there. Um, the sandier the soil, the, the easier the nematode can move through it. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, if you have compacted clay, maybe not worry about it so much. <laughs> but they can still be there on weeds. It, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's something to look out for. And they can be on many weeds and other types of plants that you might cover crop before um, planting. Uh, Mike, I want to comment on that nematode issue. Sure. <clears throat> standard recommendation to test for nematodes in New York when we had fumigants. <clears throat> and fumigation did help. Now, despite the new thinking that possibly this disruption of bio uh, microorganisms, I still love fumigation. It always improved tree growth and gave uh, much better orchards when we had nematode problems. Ian and I did a number of trials with that. So I don't see that as a negative in terms of soil health. The problem is fumigation is not available anymore in New York state. There's not a single licensed fumigator in the state. Nobody will do it. So it's really not an option right now, but it certainly was the best thing we had at the time. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Terrence. <clears throat> but another comment from Wynn about Galtrol being labeled in Pennsylvania, but not in the other Northeast states, including New Jersey and New York. It has a national label, but we need to get companies to get the state registration. So I think, you know, just to, to kind of further that discussion, uh, if you do see crown gall in your plantings, you know, please let us know. And we can certainly work with uh, the regulators to get that, you know, that process moving along in New York and elsewhere. We have something from, from Richard, uh, G935 Snapdragon, showing decline, cessation of growth, and fading leaf color to light green in second leaf after great start in year one. All other surrounding trees are thriving. Same planting, same soil prep, same spraying, same herbicides. Decline evident and identical on virgin and replant ground throughout a 1,000 foot row. Approximately 30% of trees are affected. What are your thoughts? And that could be an, an open question for the group. Mike, I answered it, and it's strictly a virus problem with Snapdragon on G935. It's susceptible to viruses. Almost all the Snapdragon wood in New York has become contaminated with virus. Uh, two years ago, we tried to send wood to the West Coast from a variety of orchards in New York, and the nurseryman had it tested, and it all was virus contaminated. It's the same thing with Royal Red Honeycrisp. Before it was cleaned up, it did poorly on G935. Once it was cleaned up, it does great. So the issue is trying to get virus-free budwood of Snapdragon. And I know Susan's working hard on it, but currently the Prosser Research Station in Washington that does virus cleanup is sort of at a standstill and it's non-functional almost. And so for the last two years, we've wanted to propagate a number of uh, Snapdragon huge quantities of trees on either 935 or other Geneva rootstocks, but the nurserymen are unwilling until we can get the budwood situation cleaned up in New York. All right, thank you, Terrence. <clears throat> uh, Mark, with the note on virus, any, anything else to add to that? Just briefly a comment because, you know, ideally when we are dealing with virus issues, Prevention is the only measure that can mitigate the impact or, uh, you know, uh, stop the introduction uh, of the debilitating effect in an orchard. And it was mentioned that, you know, ideally uh, having certified bud wood to certified rootstocks um, would be the, the way to go about sourcing a reliable material that is devoid of devastating viruses. Based and fortunately, based on my personal experience, I do not know, as of today, a single state certification program that is meaningful and reliably makes budwood and rootstocks tested for viruses available to the industry. So if virus issues are becoming more prominent, I hope that grower communities will work very closely with state authorities to revisit certification programs so that clean material can be finally made available to the communities that need this type of material. All right, thank you, Mark. And I, I see the thumbs up from Carrie too. 
And just to add, you know, uh, we have been working with nurseries in New York and the Department of Agriculture and Markets for the past couple of years. And hopefully by next year, in a couple of years, the first New York certified apple trees um, will become available. Fingers crossed. That's well, great I'm news. Comment to, to you, Mark, and to the other virologists that <clears throat> I'm losing confidence in the concept of virus free. Virus tested of certain viruses, yes, but with PCR work, people find more and more evidence of viroids, virus-like things that we never worried about before. So that's the problem with Prosser. They come up with all kinds of um, viroids in their tests, and so no longer can they certify virus-free. Virus-free is, is a foreign concept to me, uh, uh, um, Terence. And I'm glad you bring it up because virus free is not what we should, what we ought to target. It is completely unrealistic and is of no practical value to the industry. If you get rid of the most devastating viruses or viruses, that's yes, a no, a no brainer there, but virus free is a total nonsense. I agree with you. And if I use virus-free terminology, I have to apologize because this is not what I meant to use. Virus-tested is the appropriate term, yes. All right, thank you for that clarification, Mark and Terrence. Uh, I just wanted to let people know we are at, at 4.30. I wanna be respectful of your time. Um, if, you're, if you're here for, uh, you know, if you sign up for the DEC credits at this point, um, you know, you could consider yourself, you, you've got them, so you're free to go, uh, but I do encourage you, we still have questions in the chat box to get through, uh, so if you'd like to hang around and, and listen to them, you know, please by all means do and, and still continue to type in your questions. I'll also just mention that we did record this meeting, so that will include the following questions that we're about to go through, and we're hoping to get that recording out to you in an email by the end of this week as well. But with that, uh, for those that would like to, to hang on a little bit more, I'd like to go into the rest of our questions. So we have a question here. Looks like this one is, is for the pathologist in the room. How would you treat black rot on apple trees that have been neglected for many years? I have removed the invasives and deadwooded the apple trees. Any other thoughts for, for black rot? Clean out your thinning mummies, remove dead wood, and implement a spray program that has effective fungicides, Carrie? Yeah, I would say the same thing, yeah. You know, the other thing is, is that also, you know, soil tests and leaf analysis as well, just to make sure that your nutrients uh, are copacetic. Um, you know, that's important as well. I, I try to minimize any leaf stressor, or I'm sorry, tree stressors. That's really the, the goal you want to do. It might, you might not see it in a season, but you know, there's, if you do all of those things, there's, there's a chance that you'll be able to sort of um, things to get better. All right, thank you both. Oftentimes I've, I've heard that, you know, you can have some winter damage and then that weakens the tree. And then, you know, from there that, that black rock can get in and, and kind of further spread around that trunk and then eventually that can cause the girdle. So it's always that sort of chicken or the egg. Uh, so I guess just like you're saying, just keeping the trees as healthy as we can to, to minimize that amount of extra stress. Yeah. And the other thing is painting trunks. You're using something, you know, white reflective on the trunks in order to help minimize um, southwest injury or, you know, <laughs> anything, anything that's within the grower's power to limit the winter damage other than, you know, trying to, you know, make a deal with mother nature <laughs> to try to, you know, each season to have, uh, you know, friendly temperatures. But, you know, there are some tools in the grower toolbox to help limit that winter damage. And another thing, if you also paint your trunk, you might um, block some additional herbicide that splashes and kills the bark as well, which, you yeah. know, anything that kills your bark, or if you're on Long Island, watch out for the salt damage, <laughs> or near the road. Yeah. And that will also help with rodents, rodent issues too, rodents gnawing on the, like the graft union or lower part of the tree. Okay, great. Thank you. So the next question, if Ottawa 3 is the most hardy, uh, what are its drawbacks as to why it isn't more popular, more popularly used? I typed an answer to that. It is cold hardy. That's the reason it was used as a parent in the Geneva breeding program, but it's not fire blight resistant. 
It's not replant resistant. It's difficult to propagate and doesn't transplant well. And so for those reasons, it was rejected as a commercial rootstock about 20 years ago. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> we have another question. Any contribution of wind to the winter damage? I think it's very minimal. Uh, the wind can desiccate tissues, but generally tree bark and at the graft union and on the shank above it, it's very well protected from desiccation. But it's the temperature drops that kills cambium, not the desiccation. Okay, thank you, Terrence. Uh, does choice of tree guard affect black stem borer control? To my knowledge, I don't believe that that's um, a very strong factor, at least with black stem borer. Um, it's possible, you know, we, we don't necessarily know a whole lot about this at this point, but as far as I know, there is no. Um, either attractive or repellent effect of the trunk guard. If anybody else knows otherwise, feel free to jump in. All right, thank you. With the loss of lures ban, um, how nervous should growers be about clear wing borers? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I didn't really focus on the clear wing borers just because there wasn't a lot of time and I was trying to move through quickly, but there certainly are some other strategies. So the, the most common, most frequently problematic of those would be dogwood borer. And I briefly mentioned there is a mating disruption product available for that. So I definitely strongly recommend this is probably the time for anybody who um, has had problems with dogwood borer in the past to start thinking about investigating the mating disruption. Um, that has been shown to be pretty effective for this particular pest. Um, that same white latex paint that we've just been talking about, which is so helpful in so many cases, that can also be helpful with the clearing bores. Um, really anything you can do to keep the, they tend to um, go to the, the burr knot um, down at the base. So anything you can do to change your rootstocks or to do anything to um, prevent those, um, good weed management, things like that can also help with preventing it. So um, yeah, I'd say just kind of try to, and then also, um, again, a sale, it's not super effective, but it is moderately effective. So this might be also a good opportunity if you know you have problems with that to think about um, rotating that in at the right timing in your kind of uh, internal lap rotation. So that would be my recommendation, but I don't think it's going to be something that will be like a huge, the main problem facing growers anytime soon. All right. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, I think reviewing you know, some of the, the scaffolds from the, the last few years, certainly the mating disruption paired with, with some of those other material as a coarse trunk spray uh, can certainly do, do a decent amount for us. Thank you. Is there any research about disease susceptibility um, happening with more standard size rootstocks? Uh, this person hey, in particular I is... I want to know if Dean was still on, because when I was looking up stuff on rootstocks, I mean, it goes back to where Ian was publishing papers on it, and his stuff didn't talk about standards, but maybe he would know. Is he still here? Ian Merwin? I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, I don't believe like so. He, no, I think he's gone. But <laughs> if it tells you anything, no one is going back to standard trees to... Um, yeah, I, I feel like you're probably better off growing a, a, a stronger, normal, modern apple than than attempting those. I, I don't know if it's a way out of the situation. I guess if it's got a big root system, it'll be all right. But um, yeah, not that I could see. Right. enough is a very vigorous rootstock. Nobody wants to plant it because it's not precocious and it grows a big tree. It is winter hardy though, but in terms of its susceptibility to fire blight, we've never tested it. In terms of its susceptibility to Phytophthora, we just haven't messed with it because it's a, a dog of a rootstock, even though it survives winters. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Terrence. Uh, we do have a, a comment from a grower. They're using distilling heads and tails to attract and trap black stem borers on their orchard. Sort of as a, a attract and, and capture type of program. Thanks for that. Um, on the technical side, is there a specific type of white paint to use for that trunk spray? I've always heard it's it's really a 50-50 blend of white latex and water. Um, any other thoughts from the group? Nope. All right. Uh, is there any way to get rid of black knot? Uh, Making a little shift here. Black knot of peaches and cherries? 
I'm assuming it's black knot of peaches and cherries. Uh, you want it has a two year knot cycle, so you want to cut the knots off when they're um, brown. And other than that, I mean, I think chlorothalonil is probably your best stone fruit um, you, you fungicide wanted, for the job. Yeah. And go to the top of the tree. That's the problem. Sometimes you can't reach the top. Carrie? And you don't want it, you want to do it during the winter season when things are dormant. Um, you don't, so you don't want to cut them out when the tree's actively growing because uh, it's wounds and growing shoots. Are they like the green succulent tissue of growing shoots are very susceptible to black knot. Um, the other thing is removing, you know, the source sources of black knot and you need regular fungicide sprays starting very early in the season that go till about like probably May or June. Um, for us, it's probably about late May. For you guys, it might be a little later since your season starts later than Pennsylvania. All right, great. Thank you, Carrick and Carrie. All right, and that's all the questions we currently have in the chat box. Um, so I'll just give people another minute or so. Uh, please go ahead. If you have any lingering questions, please feel free to type them in. At this point, I would also invite you, you can give a thumbs up or a raise hand if you want to address any of our speakers directly. I can give people an, a minute to do that as well. To do that, you would go down, hover over your, your bottom toolbar there, and you would find those in the reactions to raise your hand and you can ask live. So I'll, I'll give people another minute or so before we, we sign off for the day. I do see a few thumbs up coming in. Uh, it looks like they're coming in alphabetically. So Adam, if, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to do so at this point. Adam Snyder. Oh, no, that was just a thumbs up for all the uh, speakers. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. We like that too, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, so I guess to avoid that, uh, we'll use a raise hand instead. So I'll just give people another few, few seconds to do that if they have anything lingering. All right, well, not seeing anything else. Um, I think we'll go ahead. Oh, someone snuck one in. In a peach orchard, if the tree dies, but the root sucker shoots out suckers, is it a bad idea to let the rootstock grow or just take fruit of that variety? Or will you compromise your orchard because of the susceptibility of that rootstock to different diseases? I don't sure I understood the question, but the rootstock is a completely different variety. It's probably not even an edible peach. So if the cyan variety dies, there's really no value in that orchard. All right, I would just just kind of second that. I mean, the, the different rootstocks being used primarily are, are, are seedling rootstocks. So to know what exactly that's going to look like, uh, you know, the likelihood of it being a really high quality peach is, is very low. And uh, would screen enclosures reduce susceptibility to winter temperatures? Well, that's a very interesting question because people have used high tunnels to protect trees. But the problem is that the temperatures warm up sometimes too much and deharden the trees, and then they don't protect enough. So sometimes you get more winter damage in enclosures, especially high tunnels. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I see we are now a, a bit over of our original end time. So I think we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting for the day. If anybody does have any additional questions, please feel free. You can email me and I can, can get them off to the, the specialist of your choice and we can continue to get those, those questions answered. But with that, I think we'll go ahead and conclude. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers for for joining us today and preparing these, these great talks and for uh, bearing with our, our lightning round sessions here. Everybody did a great job of, of keeping more or less the time. Uh, so thank you again and everybody have a great evening. <laughs>